Part of it is thinking about, well, what might a notion like nihilism, Nietzsche's famous notion of nihilism, what might that mean when we use it to think about today, when we think about the world in which we live? Yo, what's going down? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I am Troy Polidori. And this week we are stoked to be able to bring on Lars Eyer, novelist, philosopher, extraordinaire, to talk about his new novel, Nietzsche and the Burbs, which five stars. Go get it. It's fucking amazing. That's all I got to say. Troy, are you excited for this or what? I'm so excited. I've wanted to talk to Lars for so long, read so many of his books. Um, it's pretty rare you get someone who's a novelist with a philosophical background. So this is the like best possible scenario for us to nerd out. Yeah. And of course, I mean, we're not just going to sit here and talk about the plot because we don't want there to be spoilers because it's really fucking good. And there are some interesting plot reveals that I think you need to keep in tension and to, to kind of be surprised by. So we're not going to talk too much about that. We're going to talk more about the characters and some of the themes and then, of course, some of the recurring themes in his novels and in his work and in his thought and his ideas and then how they open up into the world and all kinds of things like that. So stick around for the main segment because that is what we're going to be doing. And you know how we talk about it. It's bullshitting. That's what we do best. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So first thing we want to do, though, is we want to give a shout out to our sponsor this week. Guess what? We are back with Mubi. We love Mubi. If you don't know Mubi, Mubi is an online streaming service, the cream of the crop streaming services. They specialize in indie darlings, um, foreign films, that is foreign if you are not American, um, regional films is the other way we have described this, from all over the world, all over the uh, globe, um, the avant-garde films. Uh, experimental films, documentaries, the films that flew under the radar, the great classics of cinema, all kinds of things. If you go to movie.com slash owls at dawn, you will get an extended free trial, a 30 day free trial that is extended from the normal trial that you would get. Movie.com slash owls at dawn. And we just want to highlight a couple of things that they have in their various libraries. They do have different regional libraries depending on where you are in the world. So go to movie.com and you can check out what they're, uh, what's playing in your particular region. In mine, one of my favorite French filmmakers ever is being um, kind of given a little, uh, I guess it's a retrospective you could call it, but it's Francois Truffaut. Are you a Truffaut fan, Troy? Who isn't? Of course, man. Yeah, I even like his film that is derided, Fahrenheit 451, because, you know, it's it's still kind of quirky and fun. I mean, and I think I saw that before I actually read the film or before I read the book. So, really? I don't know. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally, dude. Totally. I think I saw it in school. Anyway, they're doing um, a retrospective. Uh, on Truffaut and the film that is playing at the moment right now is Love on the Run. They just had a film that dropped off before. I should mention that, how the structure works. It's 30 perfectly curated films at a time and they get a 30-day slaughterhouse rotation. At the end of their 30-day rotation, they drop off and a new one comes on, which means there's a fresh new film uploaded every single day. And then you also have a little bit of like a time uh, kind of compression that is on you so that it kind of creates that urgency. So you go back and you figure out what's playing on movies so you can get that fresh intake of uh, of cinematic wonder so um yeah i've got Truffaut playing on mine and then there's just a bunch of other fantastic things playing on mine as well um a lot of them are ones that i don't know and i have been introduced to so many new like directors and producers and actors from all over the world and all over the history of cinema from movies so definitely go to movie.com slash owls at dawn and troy you just want to mention real quick uh something that's going on in your library as well right yeah, in my library, uh, Jean-Luc Godard's um, new film or newest film, The Image Book, um, is up to watch there. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, if you know anything about uh, kind of art house cinema, you know Jean-Luc Godard from films like Breathless, uh, the famous French New Wave director. And so, uh, and the key here we want to reiterate is movies about curation, right? It's not about having the, the breadth of available options. That's just capitalist muck, right? We want full-on curation, someone who's saying, hey, these are great films. It's like the best, most knowledgeable, cool friend at the cafe, right, that you go and hang out with and tells you all these cool movies and cool albums to listen to. That's what movie is for great um, regional films and classic films. 
So go make a friend with Mubi so that you can get the perfectly curated recommendations. Mubi.com slash owls at dawn. We also want to mention if you want to uh, help us out more tang- uh, tangibly, you can join pa- us on Patreon at patreon.com slash owls at dawn. There we have access to various tiers of supports and you can get goodies like the monthly newsletter where we have extra shitty minutes and sticky leaves as well as articles we've read and books for reading and stuff like that as well as access to the Patreon poll where you can help uh, pick our next Patreon sponsored episode and then any bonus episodes and material that we come out with. So go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn to get access to those things. Yeah. All right, man. I say we get things going. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. To start off though, you know, we got to do that shitty minute. Oh, I'm ready. This is the part of the episode where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that's grinding our gears this week. So Austin, what's got you down? All right, this is your fault. So just so the audience knows, this is Troy's yeah, fault. Yeah. So if you hate this <laughs> shitty minute, you can email us and blame motherfucking Troy because he's the one that said that I have to talk about this. And so I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about the whole Joe Rogan, Bernie Sanders kerfuffle. <laughs> yeah, dude. All right. So first I need thing an explainer. I'm gonna, what can I say? I know. I know. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to say one thing right now. First of all, it has gotten way fucking more attention than it ever should have. I shit you not. Oh, I have course. not <laughs> I have not had a single topic flood my social media <laughs> since Suleimani was assassinated. And then <laughs> so war with Iran and no war with Iran from that to a podcast host. Like the, the that's that's what the world was freaking the fuck out about. Like, you go from, we're on the brink of World War Three two weeks ago, everyone freaking the fuck, and no one's talking about that now. No one gave a shit about that now. Like, everyone's kind of calmed down now. They're like, okay, whatever, what's next, right? No, everything's fine about that now. Um, and then now everyone's freaking out about fucking Joe Rogan, Bernie Sanders, and you've got all kinds of different takes on it. I just think it's fucking crazy that it is literally, it, for a day and a half, actually, for I would say two days, for two days, it was the only thing that everyone in my field now granted selection bias i get that but still it was if people are politically inclined and especially if they're center left or left that's what they were fucking talking about man so i don't know it was just a little bit too much i imagine it was for you too yeah dude yeah so my question then is i don't know much about joe rogan other than like the um probably the first three lines of his wikipedia entry i might know (laughs) that's it yeah um is the, the cynical side of me saying this is just bad faith stuff right any attack that's using the Joe Rogan endorsement or whatever against Bernie is kind of a bad faith attack. And then the responses against it are kind of just like histrionics. And I don't know why it's such a big deal. Like I'm asking both, what am I missing if I'm missing anything? And is my, is the cynical interpretation correct or is it missing something as well? Okay. I'm going to try to wade through this as quickly and as efficiently as possible, which if you know me, those are not two of my strongest <laughs> features. Um, <laughs> so, Joe Rogan, for people who don't know, is a very prominent podcast host, uh, perhaps the most prominent actually in the world. Uh, sometimes his podcast is ranked number one, sometimes in the, but it's always in like the top five. It gets hundreds of millions of downloads every month, literally like 200 million downloads a month. Um, and he is a former martial artist. He was a state champ in Massachusetts in Taekwondo, who then became a comedian uh, he was an actor on news radio, a TV show that starred Phil Hartman and Andy Dick back in the day. Um, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was on that. Um, and then he also does still acting periodically now and then, but not really. That's not his forte. He was then the host of fear factor, uh, both the original run and then the reboot run that they just recently did. And then perhaps what he's most lo- known for now outside of the podcast is that he is the color commentator for the the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championships, right? He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I actually used to train at the same gym as him. It's called 10th Planet uh, Jiu-Jitsu, which is run by, it's a system run by a guy named Eddie Bravo, who's also one of Joe Rogan's best friends and a frequent guest on his podcast. That's who Joe Rogan is. He's kind of a bro-y, comedian, actory, sporty kind of dude, but he also is politically, I would say, kind of libertarian-ish. Um, but so he's kind of like, like left libertarian though, right? Yeah. Like left libertarian. So, but he doesn't really have very formulated, I would say economic ideas, right? So it's not like his, and this matters, this matters because his endorsement, I think should be understood from where it's coming, right? Like in the last election, he voted for Gary Johnson. Okay. 
So like the libertarian would be the word. Yeah, he's a yeah. That's exactly. He's a libertarian. <laughs> that's a hundred percent right. He's kind of like yo. Uh, uh, whatever you want to do, that's cool, man. Do your thing. But the reason this matters is because recently he came out uh, on a podcast with Barry Weiss, and she asked him who he was going to vote for, and he said probably vote for Bernie. And the reason was because Bernie was moral and consistent and has been kind of this honest, authentic figure, whereas he obviously hates Trump. He thinks Trump is uh, intellectually behind, that he's morally compromised, uh, that he's corrupt as fuck uh, in terms of his business dealings, that he's got all of these other problems, right? And he just thinks he's kind of an idiot. And then when he looks at all the other candidates like Hillary Clinton from the previous election and then the current election, you know, Warren, he doesn't trust. Buttigieg just seems like kind of like a bland, um, centrist career politician. Biden is obviously kind of someone who's corrupt career politician um, in the pockets of the big financiers. So he's looking at it from that perspective, that Bernie is like the moral guy who's been authentic and consistent, and that's why I'm, uh, I would probably vote for him. So that I think matters because it's not like he's like, I'm for socialism and I'm a Bernie bro. He's not a Bernie bro. He's kind of like a, yeah, I'll probably vote for him because of this, like, in the marketplace of ideas, he's like the good, liberal, uh, authentic guy. Does that make sense? And this is this is a common thing, right? I mean, Bernie's way ahead of everybody else with independents, who I imagine yes. are diverse, a diverse group, right? But are going to involve a lot of these kind of libertarian leading uh, white dudes. Yes. Okay. Now this is the controversy. Recently, <clears throat> the Bernie Sanders campaign, they took that clip, that soundbite, when he's uh, talking with Barry Weiss, when he says, yeah, I'll probably vote for Bernie because of these reasons of consistency and stuff like that. The Bernie Sanders campaign tweeted that out, and they made that into a campaign video to kind of buttress and support Bernie as being the consistent morally person, while also being able to piggyback off of Joe Rogan's huge influence within a certain segment of the American population, right? Now, all hell broke loose. And the reason all hell broke loose is because Joe Rogan does have a history of making quite problematic statements, particularly directed towards the trans community. There is a mixed martial arts fighter by the name of Fallon Fox, I believe is her name, and she was born male and transitioned within the last eight years, I want to say five, six years, something like that. And Rogan has used things like, like he doesn't misgender her. Uh, he may have on, on occasion on accident, but he doesn't do that on purpose and he corrects himself. He does refer to Fallon as her, but he has said things like, like a normal woman or a real woman, things like that, right? Um, he also is very loose with uh, sort of, I guess we could call it homophobic language. He drops the F-bomb, you know, um, quite a bit. And um, and then there's footage from way back in the past of him making um, some racist remarks as well, right? Like Planet of the Apes kind of remarks. And he even said like, oh, that was me being fucking racist. But he's – and I'm not trying to, to provide cover here. He's a comedian and he sits there with his buddies and they try to just say stupid, funny, shocking shit sometimes. Now, the video from the – the Planet of the Ape things was from about 10 years ago, 8, 10 years ago. And I don't want to say that, oh, he's somehow redeemed himself. But I will say that you can see that he's actually much more careful with things that he says now. I don't know if that's because he's trying to avoid blowback or if it's because he's kind of growing as a human and whatnot. But he does – he is aware of things. He's a very kind of – for a non-educated guy who didn't like study critical theory, I don't even think he went to university. Like I said, he was a martial artist and then became a professional comedian. Um, he is someone who is quote unquote a critical thinker, an open thinker. He's like the liberal marketplace of ideas guy, which is why on his show he will have Milo Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, but he'll also have like fucking Graham Hancock and Neil deGrasse Tyson. But then at the same time, he'll also have Cornell West, right? And Abby Martin, who is like hardcore, they'll talk about pro Palestinian causes on his show, and he doesn't push back on them. It's not like he's a Zionist or anything like that, you know? So he's just kind of this, let's air things out in the marketplace of ideas, and that's what he embodies in a lot of ways. Now, a lot of people hate that. A lot of people don't like that. His trans remarks are problematic. His previous racist remarks are disgusting. So I'm not trying to provide cover for those things, but that's what's going on. That's the situation. So then the question is, is should the Bernie campaign have used his audio footage as kind of a way for them to say that we love his endorsement? And that's where the debate has gone. So that's it. Does that make sense? Was that enough? Was that efficient and quick? That's like the perfect explainer, dude. Okay. Thank you for doing all the work and compiling it for me. You're like my curator of the news. Oh, I'm tired. 
Um, I mean, can I ask you really quick what you think about it? Like, do you think that the Bernie campaign made a mistake? Not a political mistake, but just kind of a, a mistake in terms of representing Bernie's integrity. You know, part of the message that he, is that he's the, you know, the moral, uh, you know, dignified figure um, oh. that you can trust. Uh, is so that hard. sort of yeah. hurt by this at all? It's so hard because here's the thing. I'm just going to sift through, I think, what are some of the main arguments that people have made online, and then we'll try and see if we can come to a, a conclusion. One is, do you want to win dummies? He has a massive audience of swing voters potentially there. That's one of the arguments that I've heard from the Bernie bros, right? That's the Bernie bro, mm -hmm. like, like, this isn't a bad thing. Let's stop playing the identity politics card. Let's not be so sensitive. Do you want to fucking win? This is actually really helpful because he's going to be able to appeal to people. And then there are all these people taking screenshots of like the Rogan subreddit and stuff like that where people are like, dude, this is – maybe we should vote for Bernie. And you have all these people that are like <laughs> talking about this, right? I shit you not. People don't understand the influence that Joe Rogan has. I will tell you this. I trained not only at his gym but I trained at gyms all over Southern California. Everybody in mixed martial arts – Every one of those bro dudes listens to the podcast. And then beyond that, adjacent to that, all of my friends from Southern California listen to Joe Rogan. My friend Jeff listens to Joe. He, he will message me and he'll be like, dude, did you hear, did you see the interview with Cornell West? My friend Jeff is a conservative Orange County guy and he's listening to fucking Cornell West and Abby Martin. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. So the amount of people that are exposed to these I would say really progressive left, maybe even radical ideas. Um, there's a lot of them. So in that sense, I don't know what impact he will have when it comes to the ballot box, but that argument does seem to have at least a little bit of weight on the surface, right? Well, that, it, but the, my issue with that though is that's not about what Bernie did. That's about what Rogan did. So like Bernie's amplify the campaign is amplifying the endorsement, right? Which means all these people are not going to hear this from the Bernie campaign, right? It's all the lefty people on Twitter and the centrists are going to hear this from the Bernie campaign. If the question the question isn't about whether Rogan should have endorsed him, right? That's he can do whatever he wants. It's about whether the campaign should have amplified it. And so all these dudes on Reddit and in the gyms and doing MMA and shit, like they're they're not affected at all by whether or not Bernie well, was to amplify. No, it. Rogan will bring this up on his podcast. I guarantee it. Oh, the controversy, yeah. I'm, and if the whole thing was just to stoke the controversy so that Rogan talks about it more, that's like super cynical. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He will talk about this on the podcast because he just talks about fucking everything. Like he talked mad shit on Stephen A. Smith, who is someone he works with on ESPN the other day on a podcast because Stephen A. Smith said something stupid. And Joe, Joe Rogan was basically like he should never be able to commentate on fighting ever again. <laughs> uh, no wonder that uh, his podcasts are like five hours long. He's talking about every dumb thing Stephen A. Smith has ever said. Uh, no, that was just the only time he mentioned the guy. But <laughs> – but so he will mention this, I'm sure, on his podcast. I think the issue is this, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Should the Bernie campaign have amplified um, the Rogan endorsement? And it was a real soft endorsement. It wasn't like he came out officially and was like, I, like a lot of these other yeah. like celebrities are, you know? It was more just like, hey, guess what? The most popular podcaster in America said some positive shit, and we agree with that, so we're going to amplify it. The question is this, is should they have amplified somebody who – is potentially going to be a voice for those swing votes. And I think that's the question. And is that a good political strategy? I think if you just want to win stupid, you know, you kind of hear that, like we just want to win stupid, um, then it seems like, yeah, okay, sure. But if there's a measure of integrity and principles and ethics that you're really concerned about, then here's where I totally 100% get the pushback. I get it. I do. Do I think that the Bernie campaign should like rescind their tweet and be like, no, we like disavow this guy, fuck this guy? Um, I think – I don't know if that's maybe the right course of action to go, but I definitely get how there is sensitivity because there's a difference between building a political program and building a social program. So for the sake of winning the election, I kind of get the Bernie bro argument, but for the sake of creating a social program within a political program that is unity within – I'm sorry, diversity within unity, which is what a political program is, that's a social issue, not just a political issue, then I do see how this creates some strange points of tension. And I'm not 100 percent sure how to navigate it, but I do, I do get it. I do get it. And I think this is just what this shows is this just shows how sticky and how messy – cosmopolitan liberal democratic societies are precisely because how do you bring together diversity and unity and then i was thinking like 
I'm like, okay, well, what about like um, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union? Like, so that's a vanguardist party that's united politically in its anti-capitalism, right? But yet socially, the issues weren't as protracted as they are now, obviously. But nevertheless, socially, there were probably very diverse people. You know, you probably had people that were more religious. You had people that worked in certain fields, people with certain requirements. But I don't know if it was as fractured just because I think today our world, I think neoliberal subjects are far more diversified. Um, and the issue of identity politics ha is much more potent now than it was before. Identities themselves have become much more carved out than they are now in terms of our investment in them and our valorization of them and then our politicization of them. And so I think that creates different challenges for a supposed like, I mean, it's not a vanguardist party, but for a populist party, right? That is supposed to be united under the single issue, which is, you know, uh, what we call it economic reform, justice, um, those kinds of things that, that really define i think bernie's socio-economic campaign but yet that at the same time it creates this weird tension because the social makeup of that party that is supposed to be united under that larger socio-economic concern is much more diverse and i think that creates much more tensions and it makes it really difficult to really have a unified uh voice in there and i think you're going to see then more conscient uh, like more tensions and things like that and contradictions emerge does that make sense yeah totally and it's a big part of bernie's um sort of new uh, talking point now, which is, it's not a talking point, it's much more important than that, but uh, it's kind of tagline or calling card right now is look at the person next to you, find somebody you don't know, are you willing to fight for them as much as you're willing yeah. to fight for yourself? And that's obviously he's pushing that sort of moral idea um, yeah. as a reason to join the join the campaign or the movement. And so you do, definitely don't want to um, kind of speak against that or speak out of both sides of your mouth about that with regard to this. But you know what, I think an important distinction to make here, and I've been thinking a lot about this um, in terms of this idea of what a, what a coalition and a movement is, is constituted of. Um, there's a difference between, I think at least, between someone having views you disagree with or that you find morally abhorrent, um, and then people whose uh, sort of ideological perspective is grounded in those views, right? So, for instance, uh, we both grew up um, in evangelical circles, right? We yeah. know of people whose sort of religious views ground intense bigotry, and um, towards whom we probably couldn't have a relationship, even at this point in our lives, right? Yeah. Versus people who maybe think that homosexuality is wrong, or think that women shouldn't work, or who think that various other things that we think are absolutely wrong and morally abhorrent, but whose views are not grounded in that, right? Who's, who maybe have a ground that we think actually has a, a sort of a universal moral compass to it, or has a universal moral value to it that we share, or at least or some tangentially share with them, right? And that, that I think is an important distinction um, that you can make. And that it seems to me like not knowing anything about Joe Rogan, there's probably a sense in which you think that, hey, especially the reason he's saying that he would vote for Bernie is because Bernie has this sort of consistent moral character throughout his career and that he approaches politics from this, from his character rather than from, you know, the cynical um, Biden-esque, you know, corrupt side. So, um, and if that's a reason why Rogan's endorsing him and Zara kind of, you know, passively endorsing him or whatever, then you can amplify that. And that's appropriate for that reason. Um, that, that distinction becomes really blurry, right? Because it can be easily be used as confirmation bias towards keeping relationships um, with people who you just like more or whatever. So it's tenuous, right? Um, yeah. But I do think that there's something to say about that distinction. Yeah, I think it's really difficult too. You're talking about this coalition. Like, who is this us? When Bernie says, not me, us, because there are some people that are going to latch onto his campaign and they're going to say, this is our campaign or this is my campaign. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like they're trying to like own it and take it away from, uh, no, but they're going to align with it so much that they're going to kind of like turn it into a cathectic object, right? And my concern is, is that when you do that, it really makes it quite difficult if there are factions within that group. And the Bernie campaign, one, if it's going to win, if it's going to gain major Democratic support, and if it's going to not just win the primary, but if it's going to beat Trump, it's going to be a very, very diverse and contentious group. It will have to be. One, because he is a populist who has not wavered from his message, and he is using the populist message against the elites, against the economic establishment as the kind of driving force of his campaign. And how are you going to unite liberals and socialists under that? 
How are you going to unite the center left Soros Jake Tapper lib, you know, the CNN lib, the MSNBC Rachel Maddow, the former Hillary voters, the people who are so concerned about certain issues. How are you going to unite them with the vulgar Marxists? You know? <laughs> and then here's and then here's the thing. Then people are going to be like, yeah, but how many people, what is it, 1% of the people are vulgar, vulgar Marxists? Fuck them. They don't matter. We need to worry more about women, identity issues, uh, black identity issues, trans identity issues, gay identity issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so then this is where I just, I don't know what the answer is. And so I totally understand how people feel that this is wrong because this has offended the fact that they have, that this has been, that they've invested in this movement as representing them. Right, that's what electoral uh, democratic politics do. They are representative, and so then they see the person that they have cathectically imbued their vitality into, seemingly spit on their cause, the thing that matters most to them. But then the other side is kind of like, yeah, but maybe your cause wasn't the thing that ultimately matters most, and we got to win first, and that the real cause is ultimately more economic. And this just, I think, actually draws the dividing lines even sharper between. The identity politics and the more kind of like econo socialist types that are really kind of battling it out, or at least that have been have been battling out, uh, battling it out since Bernie's campaign got really popular in the United States. You know? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And that's and if if Bernie does win, and, and we're actually going to talk about this more in my sticky leaves later, um, cool. that idea of holding together a coalition is going to be as big a struggle as any political um, struggle um, that the that he would have with like Congress or the legislature in general or with the judiciary branch. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a, a huge issue. Yeah. So, oh, I mean, I think really not only am I annoyed that it like dominated my feed, but I think also I just, I'm so uncomfortable. Like this is just one of those, like I, I see worlds both are sides. Colliding, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly it. It's worlds are colliding and I feel sick to my stomach when I really pay attention to it because I see from both sides and I get it. And and you know, it's the thing we often talk about. I feel pressured to come down on either side. And I'm not going to do that right here in the podcast, by the way, just so you know. Um, but I, I also, I don't know. I don't know. Because we've talked about this before. Like, you can't just be brute Machiavellian, just fucking win. You have to also have principles. And at what cost? Like, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul kind of thing? But then it's like, but if you concentrate so hard on what we might call bourgeois morality, that's what Marx would call it. And I don't have a problem with morality. We did a whole fucking series on G.A. Cohen and normativity and ethics. So, you know, both of us are in our work. We're really working through how you can have like a Marxist or post-Marxist or kind of like post-radical or radical type of theory of normativity. So we're not we're not opposed to that. But then the question is, is like, like you can't you can't compromise on those principles either. But what if you don't win because you um, I don't know. You 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 fracture the party, or, or you know what I'm trying to say. I I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it I, I just it can't be peer power. It can't be brute power. Just fucking win, and it can't violate on your principles either. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not that's a false dichotomy is the key, right? The idea yeah. of you have to be Machiavellian to win, and the idea that uh, sort of brandishing your personal moral image um, is is like. The, the beautiful soul is, is how you uh, like achieve eternal, eternal like immortality or whatever. Like right, both right, of those right. are, are wrong views of normativity in the first place. Right. So breaking down that, that divide and actually trying to see how um, power and sort of an actual kind of, you know, moral perspective on the world can work together. It's super difficult. And there isn't an answer that we have that can fit into like a tweet. Right. Um, yeah. But starting that conversation is uncomfortable. And as it is, it is, is the key. Yeah. Well, now that you've worn me out, let's get into this interview with Lars and let's talk about his amazing fucking book because that shit will be legit, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, sweet. So as we said, this week we have a special guest. It is Lars Iyer from Newcastle University, who is a uh, professor in the creative writing department, but used to teach philosophy and has also published on like Maurice Blanchot show and philosophy, as well as a boatload of novels. And we're going to be talking about his newest novel this uh, episode called Nietzsche and the Burbs. Did I get that all about right there, Lars? Sounds about right to me. Yes, exactly. 
So you've written a handful of novels in the past. Can you give people who are unfamiliar with your work just a little bit of a biography of both, I guess, your novels and then maybe even, I don't know if you're still writing professional academic philosophy, but maybe even your philosophy uh, academic output? Yeah, sure. So I wrote a series of novels um, over the last few years, and these are comic novels. They often have a philosophical theme, and uh, there's a trilogy called the Spurious Trilogy, which uh, concerns the uh, misadventures of a couple of uh, philosophy academics wandering around the country, drinking gin, <laughs> talking about yeah. this and that, whatever comes to mind. And you know, one, one of those characters is called W, the other character is called Lars, and W is always criticising Lars, he's always taking the mickey out of Lars, and <laughs> Lars, for his part, gets revenge on W by writing these three novels. So this is Lars' mm. revenge on W is by presenting W in all his glory. Uh, following those three novels, I decided to write three novels based on the lives of of great philosophers, lives of famous philosophers. Now, these novels are set in the present. They're set in um, in, a, in in mundane places in contemporary in contemporary UK. The first of those novels was um, Wittgenstein Junior, which came out about five years ago. The second novel is Nietzsche and the Burbs. That's just come out. And then there's another novel which I'm working on right now, which is called Simone Weil. It'll probably have a different title, but that, that's the working title. And it's based on the life, of course, the great French philosopher Simone Weil. Oh, that's fantastic. Does Is is W from Spurious, like, uh, inspiration for Wittgenstein Jr. and then for the, this trilogy of, of novels that you're doing now? Or, like, do they connect? Is there kind of a, a, a through line through all of the works? I guess thematically there might well be a through line. I'm not sure. The first three novels are based on my interest in the philosophy of Jewish modernism. And they're based on um, the, 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 the novelist and literary critic Blanchot's understanding of Jewish modernism. So that's what they're based on philosophically. And I thought for the next three novels, what I would do is to focus on the work of philosophers who I, I feel are quite distant from me. Philosophers I don't really feel a living connection with. And I thought I'd do that just to try and test my worldview, test my philosophical interests and see what would happen. Oh, that's interesting. So rather than writing an academic article or something like that, like maybe I would do, you're like, I'm going to write a friggin' novel about Nietzsche. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a way to explore um, Nietzsche's thought. So for me, putting the characters around my character Nietzsche, putting those characters into dialogue with my fictional Nietzsche, is a way of thinking through some of those issues which are important, um, important to me in Nietzsche's thought. Mm. Is part of the idea of bringing these figures into a contemporary world in the UK right now to test the relevance of the ideas? Certainly that's part of it. Part of it is thinking about, well, what might a notion like nihilism, Nietzsche's famous notion of nihilism, what might that mean when we use it to think about today, when we think about the world in which we live? There's an anachronism in bringing these characters into the present, in bringing mm -hmm. Nietzsche or Wittgenstein into the present. And that anachronism is also important to me, because what I want to show is the way in which the present seems to have fallen away from... You know, what um, intellectual life, a public sphere in which you could be intellectually engaged. The presence has fallen away from figures like Nietzsche, figures like Wittgenstein, and these figures who seem to concentrate in themselves such a philosophical integrity and seriousness of purpose. So part of what I'm doing in, in bringing these philosophers into the present, in reincarnating them in contemporary Britain, part of what I'm doing is to try to test the present, to think about the present as a time lacking in seriousness and purpose and resolve. Mm. Is it is it also, could you say, that you're trying to dispel a certain romanticism through this anachronism by, by kind of like juxtaposing these past figures that oftentimes we might look at as like superheroes or larger-than-life figures and that you're kind of trying to for lack of a better word, deconstruct both the kind of romantic perspectives that we have on them by bringing them into the present while also contesting some of the banality of the burbs in this particular instance? Yeah, sure, that might be the two-way traffic. On the one hand, I'm using them as a as a basis of a critique of the present. On the other hand, I'm using the, the, the present as a critique, in some sense, of the myth that surrounds these philosophers, the way in which we detach yeah. them from the particular world in which they live and the engagements that they have. Yeah, yeah. It was so interesting. Have you have you ever read any of like uh, Elon Bedu's uh, plays or anything like that? I never have. No, I'd like to. 
Well, you know, you could give him a miss. You can give him a miss if you want. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the greatest. But he's not. He's not like his idol, uh, Sartre, is uh, with the adeptness of now. Sartre is my specialty, right? Like my first book oh, just came okay. out. That's what I did my research on. My first book oh. just came out on Sartre last year, and so that's my specialty. So I, I, I. I admire somebody who can write – and I come out of a theater background and I still do work in media. Obviously, you and I talked over email about the film that I'm producing that's coming sure. out, right? Yeah. So um, so I still – I find – I admire so much somebody who can have a conceptual rigor but can also still do something with a creative output that doesn't just seem like they're trying to like – I don't know, make being an event into a narrative, which is basically what I get the feeling when I read Bedu's, uh, you know, uh, more creative outputs. But you definitely, you kind of almost reverse the order, or uh, it's not even a reversal of order. You have this really lovely kind of ability to straddle that line between the conceptual and the narratival. And so what I wonder is, like, as someone who has written academic books, why novels? And is there a challenge in in exploring rigorous theoretical and conceptual themes in a narrative form that is also entertaining and engaging and uh, can create those empathic connections from a reader? Yeah, I think that's a nice way to think about it, actually. So moving from the philosophical to literary, what's happening there when you test these ideas out in a literary arena? What happens when you embody these ideas, when you give them life, when you try to test them? So what happens when you try and create situations, you create um, events going on in your fiction where ideas are, are, are become living things? It's not just a matter of reading a dead text by Nietzsche, but asking about, say, for example, his notion of pity, that Nietzsche distrusts pity. So in the school setting of my novel, Nietzsche and the Burbs, in that school setting, there are instances of bullying. Um, and the question is then, how do we react towards those instances of bullying? Do we simply pity the victims? Or do we think, okay, maybe these, maybe this bullying is a kind of spur, maybe the suffering of excluded individuals, maybe that, that suffering is something which might push them to think about the world in a particular way. I mean, it sounds terrible to say in this, in this sense, but perhaps suffering is something which can be embraced. So by dramatising these ideas, by putting them into a contemporary school setting with which we can all empathise, what I'm up to there is making these ideas much more vivid, much more contemporary, things which really have stakes. Mm. Yeah. I'm curious also if there's something special about having teenagers do this. You know, um, <laughs> there's like a long history in movies, especially in American cinema, um, of having teenagers who are too smart for their own good asking these deep, meaningful questions. And somehow it, it's, it just resonates more. I think um, even in the book, Chandra at one point says, all adolescents are philosophers and all philosophers are adolescents, or something like that. Um, is there something special about teenagers asking these kinds of questions that that just affects us in a different way than, you know, you know, 40 year old grizzled academics. Sure. I mean, teenagers don't have the same stakes in life as we do when we're older. They don't have mortgages. These guys don't have yet have student debt. These people don't have an investment in the world as it currently is. So these adolescents can question the world as it currently is. They can question the adult world. They can question the values of adults around them. And they can do so from that kind of intensity that teenagers often have. They're often very intense, very ardent, very idealistic. They want things that they're not satisfied with, with the status quo. And that gives their questioning this, this intensity, this fervor, which makes it really exciting to be around questioning teenagers like this. As adults, we can fall away from that, that, that intensity. We can become dull. We can become it's just people who prop up the world as it currently is. My teenagers in the novel are saying, death to the world, let's destroy the world. Let's think about a world which comes after this world in which we might live, um, not necessarily happily, but in which we might live greatly in some sense. Do you think that there's a, there's like a necessity of safeness to be able to have that position? So they're insulated by the burbs. Now, I grew up in the burbs in Orange County, southern Orange County, California, which is like quintessential United Statesian burbs, right? Uh, which is very different than UK burbs, or at least I imagine it's different from the experiences that I had living in the UK too. But I feel like that there's something in 
not just your novel here where these teenagers have this privileged safeness because they're protected by the burbs, which does kind of come up a few times, right? Like they're not mm-hmm. ever having to worry about getting shot or stabbed or something like that. Does that give exactly. them the freedom to be able to philosophize? And then this makes me think about like the the ancient Greek academy. You know, the there's something very Socratic, I think, being able to take these concepts and bring them to life like you do, um, turn them into living things, I think is what you were referred to it earlier as, the, the concepts. And I think there's something kind of that you get maybe in the emergence of of the old academy too where it's like the they're no longer worrying about i don't know being invaded i mean i guess they are there's still like the peloponnesian wars and things like that but you know it's not like there's like this imminent threat that they're going to have to become warriors themselves immediately and take up arms like they have time and leisure time uh, to be able to philosophize so is there something about safeness that you're also exploring here absolutely you have to have, you have, to have time to contemplate the world around you my characters um, in the novel, the teen characters, are they're, they're approaching their, their final exams um, at school and they're no longer doing their Saturday job. They're no longer doing their work in, in supermarkets. They've got a bit of time to, to sit back and think about their lives. And that is absolutely essential for philosophy. You have mm. to have a certain amount of leisure. Otherwise, you're not going to have time to think things through, to contemplate the world, to, to think about the world around you. So time is absolutely essential. The time to contemplate, to, to be detached or detach yourself from what you're normally bound up with. And these characters, because they're approaching their exams, they're moving into revision time, so they don't have structured classes at school. And that's what's yeah. giving them these long, long periods mm. in which nothing is really happening. And that's yeah. the wonderful thing about you know, doing a PhD, for example, is that you actually, if, you're, if you've got scholarship, if you've got some funding, you actually have time to think. Hmm. Right, right, right. Troy, did you want to say anything by way of uh, of intro before we maybe even start talking explicitly about the novel even more so? Or what do you want to jump into? Yeah, I mean, I, I have so many ridiculous questions to ask you, Lars, uh, especially, I guess we can get, get this out now. Um, when did you fall in love with Doom and Stoner Metal? Because <laughs> that was a surprise to me. And as a huge metal fan growing up, especially in high school, all the, all the um, talk about creating the music that comes after music, the fucking ghost music. Yeah. It resonated with me so much. And who, who's that name you mentioned just then? Who was that? Well, you mentioned Sleep. Um, oh, Sleep. Bit, yeah, sure. Which, yeah, of, course, of course, I love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, I've, all, I've got a long-standing interest in, in drone music or modal music, so old, fo- old, old fo- forms of folk music, and some forms of metal, um, you know, some, some periods of jazz. And those interests I transfer to the students in the novel, or at least some of them, some of these, these school pupils, so yeah, the, 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 what we're looking for is a, it's a particular kind of music, a sort of drone-based music, perhaps something which which is not rhythmically um, uh, too far from I don't know, maybe funk. Um, it has elements of metal. So I guess what I'm doing in the novel with music is giving these characters a means of trying to overcome their condition. What these characters want to do when it comes to music is to overcome the people they are, people they have been, and to retrospectively justify their, 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 their upbringing in the suburbs, their, their experiences in the suburbs, their experiences at school, to put all this into the music and make it all make sense in some way. So making music together is a way for these characters, characters to resist nihilism, to try and overcome nihilism in terms of a, an aesthetic project which would allow them to, to overcome um, the, the, the boredom and status quo that they feel. Do you think that music has the power to redeem? Well, this is, this is a difficult question. It depends what's meant by redemption. I mean, yeah. if we can really understand what it, mean, what it meant, might have meant for a band like, I don't know, like, like Slint coming out of a, of a small town that you're creating this music and you know, you're looking back at it later and you think, what did we do as a, as a bunch of people? How are, we, how are we able to create this? You know, what was it about us that, that made us, that allowed us to make this music? I think the same way about, about like Joy Division or maybe some early stuff by New Order. Um, what was it? What was it that, 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 you, that brings people together to create this great art? And you can look back at your life later and say, what was it we did? How did we do that? How did we accomplish that? That's something which for me has always been really significant as a huge music fan. Is thinking about some the gathering of these teenagers and young people in their young 20s from these small towns. And you know, only those people then and there could have made this music and could have transformed their lives in that way and transformed the lives of listeners. Hmm. Well, I think in the case of sleep, I can partially answer that question. And it's a lot of marijuana. 
<laughs> it's lower than on in the novel. Sure, it sure is. Absolutely. And a little bit of acid, and a little bit of ecstasy, and as <laughs> sure, as yeah. as, Ram- as Rambo famously says, the deregulation of the senses. Right. That's right. Sure. They, they, these these people are they're looking to derange themselves in some sense because they find life just so boring and flat. And the way to the, the way to access this is for them. You know, it's, it's playing playing intense music, drinking a great deal, taking various kinds of of drugs and pharmaceuticals. So this is for them. A, it's it's a it's a quest. It's a a desire for intense life. They're looking for sensation. They're looking for to feel something real, and they're looking to to push themselves in some way to make sure they lapse back into conformity and dullness. Yeah. See, I I personally have an affinity for this type of thinking because so it's Sartre, Deleuze, Bedieu, kind of the post structural kind of world is is where my research lies, right? But um, Deleuze in particular factors quite heavily uh, in, in a lot of my work too. And so this idea of kind of scrambling the codes is something that Deleuze famously talks about. Um, and then he has this idea uh, where he obviously engages, engages with Nietzsche. And uh, in I believe it's in his book on Nietzsche where he talks about one cannot help but laugh when the codes are confounded, right? That there's mm. kind of like this madness when you do raise to the ground all of the, the values and the codes of a given context. And, and then what you're left with is – sort of pure imminence or utter beatitude is what he talks about in his essay on imminence a life right and so this music that seems to be this potency this this unbounded freedom uh, what i love about it is how you kind of almost express it as because they're they're endlessly frustrated when they're trying to make something and they're endlessly they have these hopes and these dreams when they do think that they've finally tapped into the source but they're constantly asking like where is this coming from almost as though it's like bubbling up from the earth rather than anything else. And I think that there's something really lovely about that sort of like um, primordial emergence is almost how the music is viewed, you know? Absolutely. The The music allows the characters to access a kind of chaos, which is also important, of course, with Deleuze. The idea of accessing chaos in some sense, of of finding this um, this, 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 this brokenness, this, this, this shattering of order. So what they're looking for is some kind of access to chaos. That, that, that this is what they're, they're, they're trying to find, a kind of freedom, something which doesn't belong to them, something which can't be managed, something which can't be tamed, something which reveals itself only through intensity, through a kind of madness. So what they're trying to do with their music is engage with these primordial forces. They're trying to engage with these forces and to give them some kind of form, because that's a structure. It's not yeah. simply exposing yourself to chaos. It's giving it some kind of consistency, giving it some kind of of structure, of order, of making it into a particular kind of music. So that's what they're up to. As you say, they're engaging with the earth. They're engaging with what lies beneath the suburbs, with these um, forces, with you know what, what what Nietzsche and Deleuze will both call life sometimes. This is what yeah. they're looking for, the untrammeled, the unmanageable, because everything about their life, all the people who surround them are trying to manage the world to death. And these characters are looking for life, which for them must mean chaos. They want to inhabit chaos, and that's what they're doing with their music making. You know, the way you're describing chaos, it's funny, it sounds exactly like the way that, you know, guitarists talk about drone music. So I'm thinking of like, um, Sun is probably my favorite American drone uh, metal band, and they talk about music as sort of unearthing this chaos with guitars and the feedback that comes from playing guitars and then sort of warping it and managing it and trying to control it and give it structure in certain ways. It's almost like it's a separate being that you're wrestling with rather than like a pure expression of what's in your soul or something the way like, you know, sometimes blues guitarists talk about uh, playing guitar. So yeah, it's, it's almost like I can see the through line here between um, managing chaos and, and talking about drone music. It's a perfect marriage. Yeah, that's it. I mean, Sun is certainly very important to me um, as, a, as a band. It's the idea of accessing something. With Sun's music, you know, some of their music is actually, there's a real warmth to it. There's a femininity to it. There's a sense in which what you're accessing is a place in which you can dwell, a place in which you can live. Um, it's a welcoming kind of music. The, the very presence of that, of that sound, it, the way it envelops us. It, it, for me, it feels maternal in, in a band like Sun. You know, I often wonder though whether a band like Earth. I think of the the, the mm. album Earth Two. In Earth Two, this drone is something more frightening. It's another another face of chaos. For me, if I think of Earth Two and perhaps some of Sun's earlier recordings, what I come into contact with there is a much more frightening force of chaos. 
where chaos is something which you cannot accommodate, you cannot dwell within, which is not maternal. You know, here, um, what I find in Earth 2 is a terrifying impersonality, something which, if you spent too much time with it, with it would send you absolutely crazy. It's a bit like what happened to the... It's like those free jazz artists in the 60s. You know, you think of yeah. Albert Ayler's death. Maybe he might have killed himself, he might not have killed himself. But, you know, he, he was exposed to something terrifying. And there are other, I think, the other players from, from the free jazz movement who just put aside music for 30 years. They turned aside from it because what they've been exposed to was just too terrifying. So, in other words, chaos has those... Has, a, has an aspect of something enveloping, something which allows you, to, allows you to live, to dwell, a feminine place, something maternal, but it also has something about it which is terrifying, indifferent, indifferent to human beings, in which we cannot find repose and which can send us mad. This is like uh, the great spirit that's hovering over the water in Genesis, right? The, 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 the kind of chaos of the pneumena, you're talking, I'm sorry, of the, of the, of the pneuma. Um, you're talking about this femininity and I'm thinking about kind of how a lot of times in, in ancient, uh, like Israelite theology, uh, Jewish philosophy, that, that there is like a personification and a genderization of that chaos. And then of course, you know, like with Lacan and, and female sexuation, it's, it's that which is not castrated and stuff like that, that mm. which is kind of excessive, the, the non all sort of thing. And it seems like there's a lot of those themes going on here, uh, as well. Yeah. Those themes run throughout all my novels. All my novels are concerned with, um, <laughs> yeah. with chaos and creation. And all my novels come back to the book of Genesis. And in particular, oh, to, yeah, they're, they're, it's in there in all of them. And in particular, this expression that you get in the first lines of the book of Genesis, where you've got God looking out, creating the world, separating light from darkness. And there's an interesting, an interesting phrase that's used um, in, in the book of Genesis in English translation. You know, the, the idea of, of matter being without form and, and void, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this is the stuff which, which is there. You know, God, God's looking out and there's this darkness, matter without form and void. And what God does is say the words, let there be light. And by speaking in this way, by talking, God um, gives a structure to the universe. He forms what is previously without form and without void. And that stuff without form and without void is the single thing which most interests me in philosophy and in literary writing. It is the single most important idea for me. And I encountered it, first of all, in the work of um, Blanchot, in his fiction, and in the work of Levinas. It's this idea of the there is, of the ilia, which mm -hmm. is the way they understand um, a brute being in chaos. And then thinking about that idea and, and reading about um, its sources, I, I came to the book of Genesis, where you have... Um, this, this idea of, of something being without form and void. And throughout the Bible, after that point, whenever there's a disaster occurring, whenever something terrible happens, like a massacre, it's always presented as a return to that which was without form or void. It's a return of what's called the deep. It's a return of chaos. In Wittgenstein Jr., that's why Wittgenstein's brother in that novel goes mad. Because what you see in Wittgenstein Jr., um, Jr.'s brother in that novel, what he's doing with Wittgenstein Jr.'s brother, is to try to repeat God's act of creation in his writing this book about the logic, the logos, the word of God. What Wittgenstein Jr.'s brother was doing in that novel was to try to order that which was without, without form and, and void, and the form and the void is what instead sends him mad. Wittgenstein Jr. is a character, it has to struggle with the legacy of his brother and adopt a different relationship to chaos, a relationship in which you can live and thrive and dwell. In Neutral and the Burbs, something similar is happening. The idea is that how can the characters come to terms with, how can they live with respect to this disordering chaos? And one final point here about the feminine and the masculine, or the feminine and non-feminine. Yeah, it's interesting. You get, re you get theologians like, I think it's Catherine Keener, have I got her name right? And she reads chaos and the deep and the abyss in the book of Genesis. She reads them as, um, as a way of talking about the feminine which is always disavowed in, in Christianity and Judaism, according to her argument, if I've got it right, it's always disavowed because you put an emphasis on speech, on ordering, on structuring. And what she wants to do is to reclaim a sense of the feminine abyss, the feminine encompassing. And that's what I read Sun's music as doing. By contrast to that, there are other readers of the book of Genesis who say, look, chaos is terrifying. If you have yeah. a breaking of chaos and, and the wasteland into your world, it's a, it's a destruction of your world. And the great achievement of human, human civilization is ordering. It is trying to marshal chaos. 
Levinas, the philosopher I mentioned earlier, Levinas, when you write about Hitler, thinks about Hitler in terms of the outbreak of chaos. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about the relationship between the, the feminine and the masculine here, and we're talking about theological things. I'm thinking about Aronofsky's mother, and it's not quite a perfect um, reference, but there is something interesting in that, that the masculine figure, played by Javier Bardem, his character name is the poet, and that's how he's referred constantly. He's the writer. He's the one who who dictates, who articulates, who inscribes meaning, whereas the woman who takes care of the home, Jennifer Lawrence's character, the mother, she is just kind of fertility and all she wants is for um literature for writing for articulation for inscription to kind of commune with her and to acknowledge her and to embrace her so that they can kind of have a maybe a, i don't know in there it's kind of like this it, it is that there is a sexual relation to use the lacanian reference definitely there's i think she desires the kind of like the balance but he completely overwrites if you will perpetually and then what that leads to is kind of an outbreak of chaos because of the overwriting of things whereas she kind of seems to be just like pure bounty pure like um fertility or what's the word fecundity almost mm. um that there's something about that like she's wearing white and she's pure and um, and she just wants to kind of like commune with him and then and reproduce. And that's like this joyful bounty that she can give, this grace that she can give. But writing and language and poetry stifles that, you know? That's very interesting. Yeah, so language, it, it, language is very important here because on the one hand, it can be like the word of God, let there be light, there's structure, there's order, there's a division of all things into particular yeah. categories. But then in a thinker like, in a thinker, a writer like Blanchot, what you find is an attempt to use language in a way that attests to chaos. Of course, it can't just become chaos because it won't mean anything. But what you find in Blanchot's work is an attempt to attest and to answer to uh, whatever you know, what we call the there is, the chaos, what there is. And that's something which really interested me in particular in the Spurious trilogy. Because you have these characters, you have W, you have Lars. And the character Lars, as I, as I write him, is supposed to embody this excess, this um, thing which you cannot write about directly, which, which, which can only echo in your text. So that's mm. what those those novels were, were supposed to be about, and um, quite directly. And each one of the birds, I suppose it's also about giving form to something, how, how you can give consistency and structure to that which escapes, that which flows away. So these tasks then um, um, occupy all my work. And what I try to do in each one of the birds is to think about the way in which the characters, each of them relate to the idea of creation. How do they, how do they seek to create something? You have a character called Art, and he's really the prime mover behind the band. So he sees creation as something aesthetic. We have another character, Paula, and her idea of creation is in terms of a, relation, a romantic relationship. So creation is, is what happens when you, when you get together with someone, when you have a loving relationship, a romantic, erotic relationship. And the idea for Paula then is, you know, creation is not about making some artwork. It's, it's more about being able to receive the other person as the other, and to, be, and to feel othered in turn by this, by this reception. So do you think we can take this idea of creation out of chaos as being sort of coterminous with philosophy in the sense that, so there's a, a, a quote that I, that I underlined in the book where I don't remember which character says it, but um, the suburb, don't the suburbs mean the impossibility of philosophy is the question. Mm. And so can we read that as don't the suburbs mean the impossibility of creating out of, out of nothing or creating out of chaos? Yeah, so the suburbs, uh, it, 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 there's, a, there's a form of, um, later in the novel, oh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't give spoilers away, but these are just things that, that people say in the novel, and it's not really the plot points. Um, later in the novel, you find the characters saying, look, there is belief in the suburbs, there is belief here, there is a form of life here, there is a way of living in the suburbs. It's not just, it doesn't just mean total death and absence of desire. The point is, the, 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 it's the kind of ordering the suburbs embody. So the suburbs in which these characters live are prosperous, and they're marked very strongly by desire to manage. The parents are trying to manage the children. The schools trying to manage them and make them, you know, good um, entrepreneurs of the future. So there's, there's this idea of management they're trying to break from. So there is a kind of a pseudo, a pseudo creation to the suburbs. It's manufacturing um, these obedient, um, entrepreneurial um, individuals who can then channel their creativity into into making money in some sense. I dramatise that by having Nietzsche's sister in the novel as a, um, as, a, as, a, as a business consultant. And she talks to the, the students, she talks to the school pupils about how they can harness their, their anarchism, their, their wildness, that the companies want these kinds of things. So yeah, mm. for me, the suburbs is, is a pseudo-creation. It's a non-creation. 
I love that. Um, Philip Goodchild actually was my MA supervisor, and he writes, uh, I believe it's either in Capitalism and Religion or in, uh, maybe it's his book on Deleuze. I can't remember where he writes it, but he talks about how, like, one of the things that we can learn from Deleuze is that uh, that capitalism is actually creative. Like, most people, they try yeah. to think, when they're trying to critique capitalism, they're like, no, it's not creative. And Deleuze and Guattari, in Anti-Oedipus in particular, are kind of like, no, capitalism is creative, but it's only creative within limits. And those exactly. limits kind of inscribe it and retain it. So the question is, is the reason that like anti-Oedipus is called anti-Oedipus is how can you create those pure lines of flight or in the like Nietzschean sense, how can you be the nomad or how can you kind of um, overcome that through the transvaluation of values and get completely beyond that and find true freedom, something that is beyond, if you will, all of the negative passions or um, all of the restrictions and all of the bindings that the suburbs or that capitalism or that commerce or those things in a post-industrial world impose upon us. Absolutely right. So this is, this is the thing. Capitalism is intensely creative. The question is how we, how we harness its force, how we can use capitalism against elements of capitalism. One of the things in the novel, there's an economics, there's, a, there's, a, there's a repeated um, accounts of our economic situation through a character called the Old Mole, who's an economics yeah. teacher. And what she's <laughs> arguing, her, the point of, of what she's saying is, actually, in our world at present, you know, pure capitalism, as we normally understand it, is not really operative. We are in some strange new place where you've got... Um, such a peculiar uh, um, economy, you know, the like of which we've never seen before, where you have what we you know we have now have negative interest rates. So the new configuration of capitalism is something which is just wild and peculiar, and for me, it's, it's actually unprecedented. I'm drawing here on on economic on alt economists like Michael Hudson and mm. Steve Keen, who make you make these arguments. So yeah, so the idea that there was a period in which capitalism was intensely creative, a great deal happened, absolutely right. But capitalism, as we currently find it, is, um, is, is, is being, it's turned into monopolies. Uh, we have the big four in each, in each industry, pharmaceutical industry or the publishing industry. They're, they're, they're big companies that dominate all things. And we have a, we have a sclerosis, we have a, a hardening. So our world is one, for me, yes, capitalism is incredibly creative, it seems to have led to a position where nothing is happening and all we have is money printing all we have is money streaming into um, into the the pockets of the rich and into the into the central banks and it's simply not reaching people and at some t at some stage there's going to be a reckoning and that presumably will come fairly soon we're going to see some 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 kind of catastrophe uh, financially mm -hmm. and this is my character's uh, um, in this novel, they sense this catastrophe. They sense the climatic catastrophe and the financial catastrophe. There's kind of an analogy there for the suburbs as well, right? In terms of uh, as an analogy with capitalism, and that the the suburbs themselves were, were you know invented to sort of be a a location for this kind of creation, right? To be the creation of, as we said earlier, you know, um, where families could thrive, uh, where good schools could exist, where you could be safe from. The dangers of I don't know, like the inner cities, whatever, and all the sort of racist and um, and whatever connotations that it ends up having. But then it's also sort of in this weird space where it's kind of dying, um, where people in the suburbs aren't happy and they're you know addicted to drugs and they're uh, having the breakdown of, of their families. And so it's even in this kind of liminal space where apocalypse seems to kind of be on the horizon. That's exactly right. And for me, these are the changes which are happening right now in the suburbs. These formerly prosperous suburbs are now under pressure. The middle class is contracting. There are people who are falling out of work, falling out of employment, falling into drug addiction. These these deaths of despair, you know, suicide, alcoholism, um, drug addiction in general. These are these are on the increase. So these prosperous suburbs, which, as you say, were created to to, um, to house workers, to house these um, well-educated workers. These 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 suburbs are now the arena. For this kind of this kind of despair. Now, for me, um, which is a shock, because you know, I grew up in I grew up in the boom times in my hometown. There's so much work, so much going on, so much happening in terms of you know, new 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 companies being built, new headquarters being opened. You know, it, it was Silicon Valley. To see these changes occurring is really um, an extraordinary thing. Uh, back in my back in my hometown where I grew up. Mm. Were you were you from um, the area where this novel takes place, Wokingham? Well, actually, we, my family moved out from London, uh, which is a much more diverse, we grew up in a much more diverse area. We moved out to London, uh, out, out to Wokingham, which is about 35 miles west of London, 
before it became what it is now. It's become immensely prosperous. We moved out there, and at that time, working was being geared up for massive expansion, one of the fastest expand, the, the most rapid growth of any town in, in the U, in the UK. Um, so there, there was a huge expansion of, of housing estates, of various kinds of amenities, and a, and a vast influx of wealth into the area. I mean, it's totally changed from when I moved out there as a, as a child. So yeah, you move away from from London, which is diverse, which is which has encounters on the streets where things seem to be going on, and the suburbs were just incredibly boring and suffocating, and they were full of this um, middle class snobbery, and it was, hmm. it was it was it was it was um, utterly homogenous in terms of the culture. Yeah, I think one of the things I really like about how you bring these concepts to life through these characters in their context is that you guys were just talking a minute ago about how these students, they're not just brilliant pontificators who are musing, uh, decontextualized from anything that's facing them. No, they are in class and they are learning about climate breakdown. They are learning about economic breakdown and rising inequality. Um, they are learning about these other lands like I, I really enjoy the the wellness class where they learn about Bhutan where they have like you know gross national happiness and how they only work like half the year and it's this other way of living that is very different and foreign and impossible but also seems quite trite and like how could we just apply that like we can't just start doing that here can we you know like it just doesn't seem possible it just seems like this radical alien world and they're faced with this impossibility almost the impossibility not just for things to happen, but also the impossibility for things to persist as they are because, as, as a constant reference, melancholia is fucking coming, man. The apocalypse exactly. is coming, you know? That's the thing, yeah. Absolutely. The void is the void is staring us in the face, and it's real, and these are teenagers, and I and I do a lot of work. I'm a part of a climate justice collective here in uh, in Australia, and I've it's being led, you know, obviously the, the global youth movement is being led by the Zoomers, by Gen Zers, and I, I can tell you that the anxiety that you communicated here for me, it wasn't just an adult putting philosophical ideas into teenagers' mouths. These – I feel that anxiety and I experience it every time I am at one of these climate rallies and every time I am listening to these really, really articulate and cogent 16, 17-year-olds speak about the problems that are facing us, not just the problems of environmental issues, but they talk about economic breakdown. They talk about the climate mm. breakdown. They talk about the, fa uh, the, the fracturing of the family, the breakdown of family life and the social safety nets. I mean they are so attuned to melancholia, quote unquote, that it um it was a really kind of I think a really nice device to create your characters so that they didn't just seem like pompous intellectuals who just read Nietzsche, which is not what they are at all. Mm. You know, these these people are um, these people are suffering. These people are full of despair, and this despair has has a real cause. I mean, it's not something yeah. which is middle class blues. These people right. Are, are, right. are struggling with the world as, as it is at present and the world as, as it will be in the, in the future. I mean, what are they going to do with themselves? And this is why they're drawn to um, you know, various kind of apocalyptic uh, movements. They're interested in this idea that maybe the world has to be destroyed for it to be reborn in some sense. I want you to capture what I felt must be a state of mind um, at present among young people. A sense that, you know, this world as we experience, as we experience it is over. It's finished. You know, that ever actually knows in some sense this civilization is over and it's just simply waiting for it to play out waiting for the end game and these characters are um, are, are in absolute despair for this very reason as i'm sure young people must be you know older people people i know I mean, they don't seem to feel it at all but younger people as I, you know when i see them if i go on to a protest with extinction rebellion you know I, I hear these people talking i hear these young people full of ardency and fire and yeah. full of despair and that's exactly what I wanted to capture in the novel. It's supposed to be a novel about teen life right now, about the life of the young right now. Have you ever seen uh, Adam Curtis's hypernormalization? Sure, yeah, of course. This, yeah. What you just said totally reminds me of that, where it's like everybody knows that that world is dead, but yet we're going along like it still does, you know? Sorry, Troy, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt, but yeah, I was like, holy shit, because that, that's literally a line from hypernormalization, and I, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly it. We think, we think the world is persisting, even though we actually consider, or we lie to ourselves, and we say that the world is kind of persisting as it was, but actually it's staring us in the face that it's already dead, you know? Yes, Go exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, to reinforce the point about how, you know, Generation Z and, and kids that are teenagers right now have a special 
sort of view on these and perspective on these things is, you know, they didn't seem to grow up in the same sort of um, ironic uh, demeanor that the rest of us did, right? From millennials to um, Gen Xers and everybody else kind of grew up on this idea of you, you kind of have to accept the fact that you know that the world is ending, but you can't do anything about it. So just pretend that it's not right. And yeah. something about teenagers are able to reject that and say that that's stupid. And I refuse to, um, to take that. Right. And, um, yeah, so it, it's no surprise that, that teenagers can have that, that special perspective on things. Absolutely. They have, they have the luxury to, to be ironical. They have the luxury to, to, um, to have a distance from, from these experiences because these experiences are, are happening all around them. Their families are breaking up because they've got no money. Uh, people are having to move from 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 their homes and and uh, and scatter across the, the country. These these things are are really happening right now. I mean, in the novel, I'm also interested in trying to, to for these characters to link their experiences to that of other people in the world. You know, in, in other parts of the world, the apocalypse is happening right now. It's been happening for some time. It's only now that it's kind of reached the suburbs. That's also another an important theme of the book. Mm. The idea that what they feel is connected to what other people feel in the world around them. And they're, they're trying to think about um, how it might be possible to live elsewhere. They're always thinking, maybe we could move to D Detroit. Maybe we could move to, to Greece. Maybe we could move to places where these, these, these things are, are, more, are more advanced than they are now. Because if you move to these places, they will just feel more true in some sense. Hmm. This is what the suburbs are trying to hide. Mm. Yeah, the, the suburbs are already the kind of the false promise of a type of redemption. It's the celestial kingdom, you know, paved with cookie cutter houses and perfectly manicured streets with trees that are spaced, that are spaced like a, a, at perfect mm. increments or whatever. And it's, it's meant to already be the embodiment of the eschaton. Right. And Absolutely. Um, it, yeah. it, it covers over the, the, the darkness, the splits, the void, the fractures, the contradictions, the problems. But there's always that return of the press, like Troy mentioned earlier, the return of the repressed. You know, yeah. I, as someone who grew up in Orange County, it was uh, it was such a cliche to talk about. You know, the housewife who was pill addicted and just stayed home all day because her rich financier husband was you know sleeping with the secretary and he was off making his millions, but they were miserable. And then the kids were drug yeah. dealers, and you know, I mean, it was just this. It was. It was middle class suburban malaise, but nevertheless, it was all covered over because asset prices were on the rise and stock portfolios exactly. were increasing and everyone's still able to afford that least BMW, you know, so you're able to kind of hide that shit. So you kind of put up with the misery because supposedly you're redeemed through your suffering or some shit. I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> that's right. That, that period, there's something to sustain it economically. Uh, it, it was still boom time. Of course, we know now that boom is based on a totally spurious economic system. But there's still there's still a possibility of, of living out these these fantasy lives, or at least thinking that you were. And this is no longer the case. Reality reality is hitting. It's actually hitting the suburbs uh, right now. The middle class are shrinking, and they're going to shrink further. Uh, this is a, a huge change, a shocking change. So these um, deaths of despair are quite real. They're happening right now. People are falling out of that middle class life lifestyle, and I think the effect of this, and we've still we've still yet to feel, if we have a financial crash as serious as two thousand and eight, and probably more serious than that, we are going to see. Uh, I don't know, what, what, what what can we call this? We're going to see a, 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 an outbreak of of despair and horror and misery, the like of which we we, we, we in, 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 in in the West, you know, haven't experienced for decades and decades and decades. If I could segue a bit for a second, I have some selfish questions I want to ask you, Laura, <laughs> before we have you. Things I've been wondering for years and uh, never had your ear to bend. Um, so I'm very curious about your writing style and how that evolved and where that came from, uh, the fictional style at least. Um, you have these very short, abrupt, fragmented sentences, often without predicates in them. Um, is that something that naturally evolved for you, or is there something purposeful behind that? Well, that is what kind of happened. I mean, a, a pivotal moment was the, was the editing of Wittgenstein Jr. And my partner, um, she's very generous. You know, she, she edits my work. She, um, and she just cut Wittgenstein Jr. in half. And she made it just so so terse and so abrupt. I mean, you know, <laughs> when I submitted that manuscript to the, to the publishers, it was about 70,000 words. It was longer than the previous novel, Exodus. And when she worked on it, when she finished working on it with me, it was about 32,000 words long. 
I actually added a few words back in. And that, that terseness, that sparseness, I, I really enjoyed. I wanted to work with it. And that's what I did with Nietzsche and the Burbs. So that, those rhythms you, you feel in Nietzsche and the Burbs, the short sentences, um, this is something which evolved out of that editing of Wittgenstein Jr. And it marks a break, I think, with the earlier novels. This is, these are written in a new style. And the style is extremely important to me. That's why I like to read the, novel, the, the, the novelists I, I read, like Thomas Bernhardt. I read them because of that music, because of that style. And that's very much what I'm trying to achieve in this novel, and indeed in the next novel as well. A music, a rhythm, uh, something which will carry the reader along. If, if we can talk about that rhythm too, one of the things I notice is that there's a framing device in this of time and temporality where the earlier chapters and the earlier, for lack of a better word, to use a good Nietzschean term, kind of aphorisms, like the little sections, are much longer and they tighten and they tighten and they condense and they get shorter and it creates this almost temporal panic at a formal level that also fits really well um, commensurately with the panic and the anxiety of one, the impending like final exams, but two, uh, you know, the, they, they're obviously they start a band, so this is hopefully going to be their concert. So you've got all of these things that condense and compress, like they're going towards an omega point or a zero point mm. or something like that. You know, and you feel that at the formal level with the writing style, it gets quicker and it gets shorter and it gets punchier and it almost gets a little bit more. Um, Turgid is that is that a, a word there for that? Um, but it, it's 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 palpably you you can feel it as you're reading it. Yeah, that was all the struggle in my fiction. Um, it's something I wanted to do is to give a sense of momentum. And because my work is not particularly plot driven, uh, you, have, you have to do that stylistically. So the end of a not my, my end of a novel uh, my not my novel dogma. Uh, the way I I, I I try to bring the, the the novel to a conclusion is through changing sentence structure, changing the pacing changing the way in which the, the, the words look on a page. And that's why I do Nietzsche and the verbs as well, is to give the sense of something impending, something happening. At the beginning of the novel, you have a sort of luxurious opening, and you're strolling around, you're kind of enjoying this new world and learning its rules as a reader. And you have all these colourful events. And as it proceeds, it gets more and more terse and more and more focused. And that, that, so it builds up to, to a conclusion in that way. And is your use of uh, italicization kind of in that same spirit as well, adding to the rhythm in a certain way? Yeah, that, that's always been in my fiction. The point is rhythm, try and mark particular beats uh, to make it something which, which draws the reader on. The reader know, needs to know where, where the accent falls. You know, the, the reader needs to have that um, pummeled, pummeled into her. Um, and that's what, that's what the italics are doing, to give a kind of inevitability to, to a sort of faithful <laughs> feel. And that, I felt pulverized. Oh, I did feel a little pulverized just with yeah. just <laughs> yeah, like sure. I mean yeah. it it is there it's amazing because there are themes that are retraced but every time they're retraced they take on a novel like a novel sense there's like a deepening yeah. of sense you know so it's it's at the same time I'm being pulverized by repetitive themes but it's really what's pulverizing me is the deepening and the deepening of the severity intensity we might say of mm. what's happening you know yeah absolutely that, that, that's what that's intentional so the novels work quite there's the various themes and they return again and again and again and that's something which happens in in Spurious the first novel that's yeah. the style which I which I discovered then uh, which I wanted to work with, where it just is spirals and spirals and spirals around these 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 various things, which are which are iterated over and over again with new variations, with with with, with more depth. With each one of the birds, I wanted to work um, using these techniques at much greater length to see what would happen. And each one of the birds is much much longer than my previous work, in order to allow this, this these rhythms to give the rhythms their, their play. Mm. Mm. So yeah, again, another analogy there with music, right? With the themes repeating again and deepening and deepening. Yeah, um, yeah, and this and then Nietzsche and the Burbs then is like the twenty-minute drone metal song. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, for me, it's you know, it's, um, it's like a Coltrane solo. Coltrane in the in the early sixties. At the moment, every morning mm. I get up really early and I'm writing my new novel, and um, I'm playing John Coltrane. John Coltrane is the, is the is the emblem for me of this kind of writing where you're taking a theme and you're doing wild and crazy things with it, you're playing around with it. This is, this is, this is my model at the moment, musically, is thinking about a Coltrane solo and what he's able to do with these kinds of themes. And, you know, and John, John, John Coltrane is playing modal jazz. He's not playing the chord changes, he's just playing over a couple of chords. Is what he's able to do with, with playing around with the scale over those chords that makes it interesting. 
And what, what I'm doing in the current novel, you know, I'm cutting back on, on narrative incident in order just to be able to, to solo over these, um, over these very limited changes. Troy, I'll give you the final two questions because I talked a lot at the front end. Oh, man, that's quite the, uh, quite, the <laughs> quite a place. I am curious. I, I am a huge Dostoevsky fan. Yeah. And, uh, Dostoevsky plays an important role um, in the novel. Uh, what is your sort of history of Dostoevsky, and especially with The Idiots? Yeah, I, I love Dostoevsky's work. I've been reading it for, for decades. Um, this is stuff I, I don't read contemporary fiction. I read stuff of Dostoevsky. That's, this is what interests me. Mm. And Dostoevsky's work is something I wrestle with. And The Idiot is a character you know, I, I think about, and I've thought about for years and years and years. So even though these things are discussed only in passing, well, those are maybe more than in passing in Nietzsche and the Burbs, they're actually incredibly important to me. It's not just Dostoevsky. It's a whole um, line of, um, of thinking, of, of, of um, art making in, in Russia, in, in the USSR and after. Um, it's, it's, it's Tarkovsky as well. I, 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 you know, when I'm quoting from Dostoevsky, what I often do, I'll use quotes, quotations from Tarkovsky's films as well. They seem to be mm. part of a continuum. And these are really important themes to me. Um, you know, I wanted Dostoevsky's The Idiot to stand in for this idea of leaving, living a, a beatific life. There's some possibility of leave, living a life in the moment that's wholly absorbed in that moment, which is open to the glory as a filmmaker Terence Malick would call it, another very important figure, extremely important figure to me, Terence Malick. Um, living, living in, this, in, in the moment, living in the present, um, feeling the radiance and the glory of the world around you. And, you know, this, this is an experience which um, I feel I can relate to, but it's an experience that is very easily lost as well. It's very, very fragile. And what Dostoevsky does in The Idiot is dramatise this so wonderfully. You have a character who, wherever he seems to go, he always makes trouble. Even though he's, some, he's, he's ecstatic, he's mystical, and he always seems to bring trouble to everyone around him. He's so otherworldly. He's almost childlike. And in that novel, what Dostoevsky, um, for me, what, what Dostoevsky does is to show how that kind of life is so challenging, so impossible, it leads nowhere. It ruins things. It ruins the world around you. So this is, for me, um, what that character, the idiot, embodies. A holy idiocy which ruins the world. It's too good for this present world, too innocent for it, too repeat. Did you see? Did you see A Hidden Life, by the way, speaking of oh, this? Oh, I, I saw it uh, I saw it two or three days ago, yeah. And do you yeah. think that there's something similar about Franz's character there, that at least the way that Malik portrays him, because it's, he diverges he diverges quite a bit from some of the historical ideas. He does indeed. I, he does indeed. Yeah, yeah, I love how he doesn't put put a justification in his mouth when the Nazi soldiers continually ask him, why are you doing this? Do you think this is going to stop the war? Like, what is the yeah, end? Exactly. Do you, yeah. and, and he kind of doesn't have an answer. It's almost like he's just attesting to the more. He's attesting to the beyond. He's attesting mm. to that, that, that thing that is alive that he cannot say no to. That's exactly right. And this is, for me, something which runs right throughout Malik's films. You know, I see mm. a direct, direct line from Dostoevsky. And of course, he quotes Dostoevsky directly in Tree of Life. Uh, Brad Pitt's character, the father, Mr. O'Brien, quotes directly from Brothers Karamazov, from Father Zosima's monologue. Mm. Um, there's a moment where he, 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 he attains a kind of humility. And it's in the To the Wonder as well, Ben Affleck's character, he kneels at the feet of, um, of, his, of his French lover um, to ask for forgiveness. And these things come directly out of Dostoevsky. And mm. you know, for me, I'm constantly thinking about someone like Terence Malick. I'm go I Google him all the time. The very fact that he's alive is a wonderful thing for me. The fact that he's making more films. Hey, um, let me just tell you, we ditto, we, ha we have the three segments on this show, right? One is called The Shitty Minute, where we rant and rave. Then we have the main segment. Then we have called The Sticky Leaves, which is Troy named it, and it's based off of a Dostoevsky, the brother Brothers Karamazov uh, oh, speech. Oh, I remember that. Which I yeah. Yeah, you know the bit. And then My Sticky Leaves, that's where we like recommend something that gives us life in a world that might be potentially, uh, uh, sorry, that gives us meaning in a world that might be potentially void of all meaning. And last week, I talked about uh, A Hidden Life. So I fucking, I am a Malik right. lover. Big time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing. You know, that, that year you have, you have Malik's Tree of Life and you have Melancholia that same year. And thinking about those two films together is something really interesting. Well, Troy and I were theology students at the time doing grad school in theology, and every oh. single radical theologian slash philosopher had to watch uh, – it was 
Antichrist, Melancholia, and Tree of Life were like the three that if you were studying in that world and you did not engage with them, then you were not really a proper blogger because that was when the blog is (laughs) famous. Wow, that's that's fantastic. That's (laughs) great to hear. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, Troy, last, send us out. Last question. What do you got? So, yeah, I guess this might be too big of a question to address in a couple of minutes here, but um, uh, there's this the quote in the book that I, I wanted to talk about a bit. Um, again, I don't remember who said it, but the, the idea is that nihilism is not something that exists when belief is gone, but that nihilism is itself the father of belief. It's always there in the midst of belief. Um, yeah, that's right. You get that from, from the early Nietzsche, from the notebooks by the early Nietzsche. Um, this is something which changes throughout his work. But in, the early Nietzsche suggests that nihilism is right there at the beginning. And the reason why you have um, any kind of belief system, any kind of structure like philosophy or art or science, the reason why you have culture in general is because of an originary nihilism. That's what, that's what the early Nietzsche suggests. He changes his mind later on. So nihilism is something which, is, which, which motivates um, all kinds of cultural life from the very beginning. In his later work, he seems to regard nihilism rather as a falling away. It's more complex than that. And for Nietzsche, you know, the ancient Greeks are wonderful because they're able to contemplate suffering and not try and compensate for it through their philosophy, through their art, through their religion. So that's what's wonderful about the ancient Greeks for, for Nietzsche. They can bear the thought of nihilism and they don't run away from it. They, they, they're not, not frightened of it. They can incorporate it into their, into their tragic, um, tragic art. Do you think this is because I just finished reading Ovid's Metamorphoses, and I remember I was talking with Troy about this. I can't remember if we talked about it on the podcast, but one of the things I, I enjoyed was stepping into the world of the ancient Roman poetic mind because it there wasn't this need to fix and to overcome the tensions and the contradictions, but to kind of almost rest with them. And it was I was because it was almost like they are fated, therefore. Uh, the test of a virtuous person is how you deal in the midst of these things rather than simply trying to overcome them, whereas mm-hmm. the modern mind in its teleology, its technological teleology, has to fix everything, and it rushes to fix, and so it doesn't allow you to bathe, let's say, in the tensions that emerge from maybe that nihilism where there's both beauty and horror that are confronting each other that it that insist at the same time and in the same mm-hmm. place on the same people. Does that Does that make sense? Yeah, certainly. And thinking of thinking of that of that of the, of the, of the, I think of Marcus Aurelius, and yes. there he is. He's he's um, battling the the proto Germans. Um, there he is by the river, and he's writing the meditations every night. He's writing these things, these instructions to himself as to how he might negotiate what what lies before him. Uh, people lying, dying on on the battlefield, and his attempt to remain somehow virtuous. I always find meditations incredibly moving for that reason. There's something very Dostoevsky in, uh, as a theme there as well, right? In the the famous you know central part of the book where Ivan and Alyosha are going back and forth about the problem of evil, and Ivan lays out his you know insurmountable case against God, and Alyosha part of Alyosha's response is just to say, in a sense, yeah, you're right, but I kind of have faith anyway, right? Yeah. And that faith yeah, in the sure. midst of doubt is is how faith works, and you can't have it without doubt. It's constitutive yeah. of faith to have doubt. Absolutely. I think this is, this is very well put, exactly. So a kind of gratuitousness of faith um, that you almost don't know what to do with it, uh, what it is. So if you're someone of faith, if you're, if you're a holy fool and you live in faith, you are mm. out of sync with your world. You're out of place. You're a wanderer. Mm. Yeah. Well... I mean, we've talked for about an hour now. I know you are a busy person. Um, you've got to go listen to your Coltrane and write your next novel so that we can have you back on <laughs> next year when your novel's out and we can talk Sounds about good. that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th- this is awesome. I mean, where can people find your book? Where can they find your work? Where can they follow you online? Um, all that good well, stuff. Well, I've got, you know, Twitter is utterly spurious. So come and join me on Twitter. Um, the interesting tweets going on at the moment. I'm tweeting bits of each one of the verbs. To come along and join me, utterly spurious. Otherwise, the books are in all good bookshops and all the normal online retailers. Uh, Nietzsche and the Burbs is available everywhere, really, everywhere, all over the world. Great, great. Um, I pitched it when I was about 50 pages in before the first Melancholia reference. And I'm only saying this because I'm going to pat myself on the back because I'm good at this shit. <laughs> he did. I can back him up on this. I texted Troy and I said, bro, it's Sing Street meets Melancholia. And he laughed because <laughs> <Cool. laughs> uh, first of all, like Sing Street is one of my favorite films of the last few years. 
Um, Melancholy is one of my favorite films ever, but I want to add a third one to this. It's Sing Street, because, you know, you got the band and the high school coming of age kind of stuff. Of course, Sing Street is just like pure positivity and joy, and it just keeps going up Mm. and up and up. So that's why the Melancholia comes in. But then there's a third film I want to put into this, A Serious Man, because I just watched this, the Coen Brothers film, (laughs) which has that Jewish apocalypticism too, so maybe I'm... yeah, so Sing Street meets Melancholia and uh, a serious man is how I that would be my elevator pitch to the executive if I were selling this. That's song. great. I love that pitch. That's brilliant. <laughs> oh God. Well, cool. Well, Lars, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a great book. I just finished it today, so people out there, um, I cannot recommend it highly enough. I laughed too. We talked a little bit about some heavy themes in this. I do want to reiterate because I'm going to say this at the top of the show as well. It's also funny as fuck. And I just want people yeah. to know that. Like, <laughs> like laugh out loud funny to the point where I felt embarrassed sometimes in the cafe when I was reading it because I thought the table was probably looking at me because I was just laughing. <laughs> That's great so, to hear. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful day, man. We appreciate you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's yeah, brilliant. Th- thank you, Lars. This has been fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, bye now. All right, sweet. Thanks so much for that, Lars. That was a fantastic discussion. Have you finished the book yet, Troy? No, not quite yet. I just, you just finished, finished it today, today. Yeah. 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 I did. I uh, I decided to sit at a cafe and neglect some of my other work and just, <laughs> just power read. through it. Well, actually, technically, today's a hospital, or a hospital, a holiday. Yesterday and today were Australia Day slash Invasion Day. So. Um, Pretty much all the businesses are closed and everything like that. So normally, because I kind of create my own schedule for the most part, except for when I'm teaching and we're also in summer right now, which means that I don't have any classes to teach or prepare for or anything like that, except I am preparing for the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy, which, by the way, you should all sign up for, everybody. Remember, take my class, Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy. Yeah, sign yeah. up. It's cheap as fuck. I'm teaching a class on my book and on Sartre's Critique of Dialectical Reason. So take that shit. But um, I, uh, I just kind of sat at a cafe and finished the book. I was like, fuck it. I'm going I'm going full on into it. That's the way to do it, man. It's definitely a cafe book. And an awkward totally. laughing in public book. Yeah, for sure. It is totally. Yeah, yeah. So all right. Well, we already had a great discussion that kind of lit my fire, but now it's time for the sticky leaves. This is one of the, the uh, this is the time in the segment where this is the time in the episode where one of us gets to talk about something that is giving us meaning in a world that is potentially void of meaning. So, you know, um, what would you say to some suburban kids, Troy, that are trying to find authenticity in music or beyond the suburbs and the bland nothingness that is facing them? What kind of meaning can you offer? Well, I'm not sure that uh, suburban teenagers are the ones asking the question that I'm going to try to give a, oh. a partial answer to. Um, so the context isn't great, but I will say that a lot of people, and we talked about in your shitty minute earlier, um, the possibility of Bernie Sanders being coming president, right? And the, and the problems associated with keeping this coalition and movement together as a sort of way of, of uh, making political gains, right? Um, a lot of people seem to ask, not just me, but just on the internet in general. Sure, it's possible Bernie may win. People are starting to come around to that idea, right? It looks like right now, probably when this episode comes out, the Iowa uh, caucus will have um, already happened or be about to happen. So we'll know for sure, but it looks like Bernie has a very good chance of winning the Iowa caucus, and that gives him a great chance of winning the nomination. And of course, all polls show right now that that Bernie would sort of um, defeat Trump pretty handily. Of course, many things can happen until then. But I think if you were a betting person, um, it, he's a, has as good a chance to win as anybody uh, if maybe Biden's pretty close. So the question then would be, what happens? Like, how does an avowed democratic socialist actually achieve anything as president when clearly not only the opposing party, but his own party will be acting against him in Congress. And of course, the uh, judiciary has more conservatives than liberals. And even the liberals probably wouldn't be be ready to strike down sort of things uh, that he would be in favor of. So how in the world does Bernie, President Bernie Sanders achieve anything other than just being a lame duck who pounds on a on a pulpit for four years and then is voted out because he's totally ineffectual. Um, and obviously, I'm not a political scientist. I don't know the real answer to that. But I will point to one thing, and it is a, a sort of revolves around this idea of the coalition building that we're talking about earlier between many diverse peoples who share in some 
sort of like generic shared idea of wanting a better world, even if they come from different parts of the country, different careers, speak different languages, um, all these different things. Last month in Finland, the um, postal workers of Finland, which I guess involved something like 700 workers, not very many people, um, their union was in a fight with the with the government over um, their salary. And so they decided to go on strike. And then following that, 100,000 people um, in different sectors of Finland went on a three-day strike in transportation. They grounded the planes, I think like uh, some different uh, train unions and other white-collar workers, um, pharmaceutical companies, miners, technology companies, fuel-producing companies. 100,000 people went on strike in Finland. And do you have any idea how many people Finland has? 5.5 million. Yeah, so 100,000 people went on strike in a in a country of 5 million. That's a shitload of people, right? Yep. And all these different... All to support 700 workers Wow. Um, in the postal, in like the, the government-owned postal uh, monopoly or whatever, right? Posty Postal Service, it's called, which is adorable. Um, the problem, the reason why that can't happen in America, or the reasons are varied, right? But one big reason is sympathy strikes are largely illegal in America. You can't go on strike except for your own self-interest, basically. So if you notice, whenever the teachers' unions goes on, go on strike, they always strike for their salary and benefits. And then they talk about things like educational environment as another reason why they're striking. That's because they have to keep it ambiguous because they can't largely strike for the sake of the students. It's illegal. Mm. It would be an illegal strike and they could be fired for it. Mm. Uh, and sometimes conservatives will sort of in bad faith cynically complain like the, the teacher unions are greedy because they're just striking for their own salary. And it's like, well, yeah. they're not allowed to strike for anything else. <laughs> so they have to say that, right? Yeah. Um, and if they publicly say anything else, then the they can easily be fired and then they can't take that to court, right? So sympathy strikes are largely illegal. It's complicated, I think, uh, in the, the legal uh, environment of it, but it's, it's basically illegal in America. You have to strike for your own self-interest. And it's not illegal anywhere else except for maybe the UK, I think, has some similar laws against sympathy strikes. Um, almost everywhere else in Western Europe, it's legal to do that. And so in Finland, you have an example there of different sectors of the um, country, employment sectors, all striking for 700 postal workers. <laughs> right you try and fuck with them that means you're going to come for us next right so we're going to strike in solidarity we're going to ground the planes and then immediately the postal workers got what they need what they uh were asking for that kind of shit doesn't happen in america but the hope is that it could right hmm. that's how labor actually gets power and that's how you actually make things or one way you actually make things better for people that's how it's going to have if it's going to happen with climate change that's how it's going to happen right a general strike of 5 to 10% of the population who says we will grind the economy to a halt unless we pass some legislation that ensures that we have a livable planet in a few generations. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that could really happen in four years, that kind of dramatic social change. But the hope is that that's the plan. The plan is to make a movement that actually can give labor enough power to bring capital back to the negotiating table. Because right now, there isn't even a negotiating table, right? It's just one group completely owning the other in this country. And it's been that way for a long time. It was less so that way in the post-war era. So Elizabeth Warren talks a lot about labor power in that sense, right? But Bernie's the only one who has this kind of vision in the mind, I think, where he's actually said he plans when centrist Democrats fight against legislation that's popular and that he supports to go to their um, district and bring millions of people if it comes down to it, right? Fuck yes. And that's not, and there's going to be complaints about him being an authoritarian and him using um, strongman tactics and him being just like Trump and shit like that and centrist, right? The key here is it's what the people want, right? right. Our government is not representative right now. It's not representative of what the people want. No, it's a so, democracy. Yeah. And it's obviously, in, even institutionally, from um, gerrymandering to electoral college and everything else, uh, it's not representative of the way that what the people actually want. So it's not authoritarian for many reasons, without being just one of them. Um, 
I don't know if it's possible. It may be high-minded. It may be naive. It may be missing out on all the different levers that capital has to play. Uh, Obama could come out tomorrow and say that Bernie is the devil and that's the end of his candidacy. I don't know, right? But if if we're going to actually address things like climate change, if we're actually going to address things like the deaths of despair we were talking about earlier with Lars that are you know as prevalent in America as they are in the UK and the suburbs – um, and in the South and in the uh, Rust Belt and everything else, if we're going to actually address the issues that face us from identity issues to political issues, to economic issues, to global catastrophe issues, that's going to have to be a necessary element of doing it. And Bernie is the only one talking about that and um, willing to engage in the kind of uh, tactics that involve um, a mass movement. Um, if you believe in that, if you think that that, even if it's high-minded, is necessary to achieve the things we need to achieve – then I think Bernie's your candidate. And I can't promise that it's, he's going to win. I can't promise he's going to be able to accomplish those things. But I can, I'm can i pretty damn sure he's going to try. And so I think yeah. that's thats what we have right now. Um, so yeah, I think these finished strikes that happened last month are a really good example of the fact that this can't happen. I don't care that Finland is 5 million people and America has 330 million or whatever. We add economies to scale, Right. <laughs> it should it should help us if anything that's else, right. right? We can grind not only the economy to a halt, we can grind the global economy to a halt. Finland can't mm. do that, right? So if you want to talk about needing um, global um, sort of uh, teamwork when it comes to things like climate change, that gives us even more power, having uh, more and more people and being the center of the world economy. So um, that, that, that's just my pitch for anybody out there who thinks that um, Bernie is just a naive idealist and that he has – no plan for actually getting across any of the legislation um, that he proposes. I would say you're probably right about the fact that Congress and the judiciary is going to be against him and his own party is going to be against him. But I will say that there's, there is a plan. There is something there to hope for. And I can't promise it'll work, but it's something. And you know what? I think it's a lot better than the something, which is we're going to go in there and get into the marketplace of ideas and convince conservatives to come around. That to me sounds infinitely more idealistic. Um, this idea of forming a coalition uh, of labor. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the optimism. We've both been optimistic uh, in the past month uh, on the podcast about Bernie's potential presidency here. Um, you know, the polls are showing that he's pulling away from Biden in Iowa. Um National polls are alternating between having him or Biden first. The more and more of them are showing him having uh, taking over first place, and then even closing the gap on the ones that still have Biden leading. And the key would be if he wins Iowa and then destroys him in New Hampshire, that that then has a huge effect on the national polls as well. So here, here's the here's the thing: is I I do I think you're absolutely right. You know, we don't have representative democracy right now. And all of the charges of authoritarianism do fall flat ultimately because um, him using his platform to galvanize people power to meet at certain locations is not authoritarianism. That's facilitation of a sentiment that, that is already there. So I think we need to think but, – but people have such a hard time and I'm sure there are vested interests uh, from – you know the, the 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 center media for thinking this way too, and also it's just ideological and unconscious habit. But the fact is that they can't they can't get away from the comparisons of Trump, and they think that anybody who speaks in a way that is not just prefabricated centrist garble that that is somehow fucking radical and crazy, right? But here's the thing, I I think like. And maybe I have just drank the motherfucking Kool-Aid, but like when I when I see people online that are hardcore, like never Bernier types, and I read what they say, it seems so clearly loaded with invective that that is coming from like resentment or bias or something that that it makes me think, and I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes me think that that they're hurt or that they're jaded. Not all, not all of them, of course, but that many of them are hurt or jaded, um, that that they have been let down, that they really either loved Hillary, and I'm talking about like you know center left types or Dem types, like Dem establishment types, um, or I, I don't know how many of them are are like 
billionaire left Dems that are like clinging on to um, like the Mike Bloomberg supporters. Like I don't know how many of them there are. I think so many of them can be won over is what I'm trying to say. And I think if they see a campaign that can maintain that coalition, that power of coalition, I do think it will win over a lot of people, even if they kind of plug their nose and vote for Bernie in the general simply because it's against Trump and they don't love him. I do think that that many of them are going to kind of like, well, fuck, we got to give him a chance and we'll see what we can get out of this. And I think I think many of them will be won over. Some will not. Some will not. Some are going to hate him and they're going to fight against him and they're going to kick in the screen. They're going to kick in the screen, uh, kick and scream. But I'm talking about the constituents, not necessarily media personalities that are paid to be like the opposition yeah forget MSNB, msnbc hosts like they're not real people talk about real people you know yeah um, i mean maybe chris hayes you know he's not perfect obviously the, the exception that proves the rule right he is the exception <laughs> yeah 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 um, but i do think that the average person the people the human the humans they are human the other ones are not humans they're just like <laughs> fucking media suits but the humans man the citizens i i do think that a lot of them are going to be won over yeah, and you know, it's it's really hard not to go down like a psychoanalytic angle and think that, you know, I think for a lot of centrist Dems, they pride themselves on their sort of having their politics flow from their moral center, which is good, I think. You know, that can come across as virtue signaling to a lot of people because usually the tone of it can be annoying or whatever. I don't really care about that. I think for most of these people, this is honestly who they who they are, right? They really want to be good people and they think that um the kind of idealistic lefty side of things is just way too high-minded and not out to lunch and it can't ever be effective so this is the best you can do and still be effective is to be a centrist and negotiate right um with capital and then of course always you know give up the ghost book or give up the game before you even play um but that's just part of you know how things work um and then they see a leftist candidate who might actually win who has a chance to win without compromising at all on these sort of crazy, out of left field, high minded ideals, and that's a challenge because that's challenging the very notion that you have to negotiate your principles to win, right? Uh, and that's hard for people to accept. But I will say this: whether or not that's just a psychoanalytic, you know, armchair take, and that's totally wrong. I don't know. Everyone's invited in. Look at Peter mm-hmm. Dow; he was one of Hillary Clinton's um, like bulldogs, right, in the 2016 yeah. election. And he is like left Twitter's favorite dude now. He's called Chairman <laughs> Chairman Dow now. Um, everyone's invited in. Like you don't yeah. have to ask for forgiveness. You don't have to say you're sorry. You don't have to say you were wrong. Maybe you weren't wrong. Maybe that's all just you know blush anyway. Um, everyone's invited in, and that's I think an important part of the the movement. I think is that you know I don't think anyone started here, right? No one started here. Um, we all, you know, went to college or read a bunch of lefty books at university or had some professor who was a Marxist or whatever. And, um, you know, the classic story that everyone everyone has and ended up thinking, hey, we have these principles and we're going to fight for them even if it's a losing battle. Um, and uh, we don't care about having these sort of like Pyrrhic victories, right? We want actual victory, but we want to do it on the right in principled terms. Um, and it's possible. It actually might happen. So... Yeah, we're being optimistic the last uh, few months here. I don't think it's a naive optimism. I think we're fully ready for it to crash at any moment, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, but it's the only hope I think we really have uh, for some of the things that are on the horizon. So we should fight for it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I guess my biggest fear is that I think he'll win the primary unless there's a nefarious behind closed doors deal that the DNC cuts. Which there right? will surely and- be. <laughs> they are going to do their best. I mean, you just saw that fucking who was it? Was it Podesta that is on like the for yeah. the commit? You know, like, and I told you he was out here in Sydney just recently, and he was like all about Beto at the time. That was a couple months back. Well, a few months back now. Fuck, maybe a year ago yeah, now. That feels but anyway, like <laughs> it, it feels like it was yesterday. But he was here, and he was like Beto was the guy, and so he had all of these reasons because of his own dem uh, establishment dem dem establishment logic that beto was going to be the guy that everyone was going to support so you know that he intentionally tried to fuck bernie in 16 we have the fucking receipts bro um so you know that there is a strong likelihood of a concerted effort to derail his campaign if that doesn't happen 
and he does end up winning, there's still no guarantee he wins the general, especially if the economy keeps hiding its contradictions like it is. The banks are managing, the central bank is managing liquidity through its repo functions, which is, they're not calling it QE, but it is QE. Um, but they are basically propping up the market and uh, increasing the rate of asset inflation, asset price inflation. So it looks like um, there are booms that are it looks like the economy is booming in a lot of ways and trump can keep touting this and business people are you know making profits at least they're extending their the valuation of their corporations i should say even if profitability is kind of slowed down productivity is slowed down manufacturing is slowed down but if you can cover over all of these things you know wages are still stagnated since fucking 70s or 80s depending on the stats you look at but my worry is is that that trump still hasn't had something that's going to be the thing that derails his campaign. And it's very hard for um, a one-term president to be unseated, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to know how that's going to work out. Uh, if anybody could lose an election with a strong economy, or at least the appearance of a strong economy, it would be Trump, though. So uh, <laughs> we shall see. And there's, there's something to say about the fact that, you know, Bernie's popular in those states that Hillary lost, that she yeah, shouldn't have true. lost. That's it, man. That's it. Like I, I thing is, I just don't want to be like in the bag, like because I'm already in the bag. But like, I feel like he's gonna win. I already told you this. I do. Like for for all of these things that you're saying, I do think that people are gonna be won over. I do think that he is popular in those Rust Belt states. I do think the flyover states. You know, like I think there's a chance, man. I'm very hopeful. Even after all of the despair, despairing, nihilistic, impending doom, melancholia conversation that we had earlier, I'm still optimistic. Yeah, we said that doubt is constitutive of faith, right? Like, despair is constitutive of hope. <laughs> I love it. You gotta it. have both at once. Perfect. That'll be uh, the title of our film instead of, like, I don't know, doubt and anxiety and stuff like that. We can talk about... Well, no, we can't talk about hope because Obama already ruined that word. God damn it. <laughs> In the political sphere, anyway. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up this uh, episode there. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Owls at Dawn. If you want to follow us, you can find us on Twitter, owls underscore at underscore dawn. Same at Insta. You can email us, owls at dawn podcast at gmail.com. Definitely go out and get Lars's book, Nietzsche and the Burbs. As he said, it's available fucking everywhere. It's uh, eminently affordable, so go and get it. I actually read mine on my phone, so if you got the Kindle app or if you got a Kindle, it's a great read for that too. Check that madness out. Uh, what am I missing, man? Yeah, and I, we also want to mention if you want to give us a five-star review on iTunes or any of the major platforms, if you ask a question in your review, we will answer it on the air in the next episode. Awesome. And I think that's pretty much it, dude, unless you got anything you want to say. Just one more thing I can think of, dude. What's that? Das Vidani, Amerikanski. Peace.